My name is Bodil Pettersson and I am an archaeologist from Linnaeus University in Sweden. For about six years now I've been working with a research concept named experimental heritage. It's a combination of archaeologists, artists and communities that work together to research the contents and different meanings of heritage for us today. Welcome to this presentation of Experimental Heritage Swedish-Irish Explorations. It's a translocal art and archaeology practice and it's performed in communities in Ireland and Sweden. We collaborate through a transdisciplinary approach and a practice-based methodology. Experimental heritage has developed as a collaboration between artists and archaeologists with the aim to develop a shared artistic and archaeological practice in the landscape. The process involves explorations in both Sweden and Ireland and a cross-cultural approach aiming towards combining art, archaeology and heritage in a landscape setting. We work from materials such as stone and water, and we are exploring together concepts of movement and time. The multi-temporal, that is our world and its many layers of different times at the same time, is a consciously chosen perspective. We do not wish to work with traditional timelines or spatial divisions. We strive towards integrating tangible and intangible aspects of art, archaeology and heritage and to find matter in between and behind the immediately accessible. In this presentation we will take you on a boat trip from Sweden to Ireland via a film that was produced in 2019. And after that there will be a dialogue between Maria Kerin from Ireland and Hans Gurstad Nilsson from Sweden about the making of the film together with artists, archaeologists and communities in Sweden and Ireland. The film takes its departure in a combination of a research and community-based project exploring the ritual landscape of the past with our own bodies in the present. Stone and water, as well as movement and time, are important ingredients in this multi-temporal exploration through performance. We oscillate between the analytic and the sensuous, and this is one of the points in the collaboration between us as well, our different approaches to landscape and body. As an archaeologist, my fascination in this collaboration lies in the possibility to explore, in both analytical and sensory ways, the relations between landscape and identity. I'm personally inspired by the phenomenological approach and the use of experiential practice to explore what lies behind why we are so interested and attracted by places where people once upon a time have been performing rituals.
There's an interesting thing when you collaborate with somebody you don't know. You often meet their edges of fear. And I guess as choreographers and dancers, we, we want to really, through the body, work out how we can create trust and a safe space and support for those we collaborate with. So I would use somatic practice very much this deep listening and sensing. And this was very strong in my work with Hans, even though we worked over the internet for 10 meetings online, uh, about an hour and a half each time. It was deep listening, really. It was not just listening to what we were both interesting in, interested in and sharing, but it was connecting to what were the values and really trying to hold, get a sense and hold those as we created from that place together. So uh, Hans ha really, really honours humbleness and the, being humble to the memory of the landscape. At least that's what I sensed from our conversations together. And he wanted to bring that quality through in the movement. And I know he was nervous about how we would create this movement, not as a token, but as a real deep, considered response in the landscape. And so receptivity, how do we receive? Emily Boselai, the political scientist, would talk about the urgency and deep need for a receptive quality when we're listening, this deep listening, consideration of other, of their expertise, cross-cultural differences, engagement on all these layers and these levels. And for me, somatic practice and movement from the body and listening deep in the body through awareness and presence helps me through these borders and boundaries and helps to break them down. The set part of the choreography came out of a conversation with Bodil when she described the island with her hands like the shape of a boat. And we talked about inversions then, so much with hands as well. And my research since incorporating this figure of eight and this, of course, it's the infinity sign, has actually led me to a very interesting finding. In the sixth century, the Irish monks Early Christian monks met Swedish monks in St. Paul in Switzerland, in the monastery there. And the Irish monks went from the spiral and the closed circle and drew into this new open circle. It closed it and then opened up again into what we know now as the figure of eight or infinity sign. And it was like we rediscovered that, going from a circle the Celtic closed circle, into the boat, into the circle, and opening again. And this led us on a very interesting journey further from making the boat into a pattern. When we trace the pattern on the landscape and the sand, we saw this very nicely. And we took that pattern to knitters and asked them to design this pattern into a a map that we could follow for knitting. So the techniques we used when we gathered people at the first moving the ship's site were based on body-mind centering, authentic movement and Chinese medical systems and the late great Antoinette Spillane system. I've had so many teachers over the last 20 years and mixing artistic practices and tools and also creative tools from movement practice. Our primary aim was to make people feel safe, secure, supported, that they would trust us to lead them and then trust themselves to participate and expand as they did when they improvised and trust the landscape that they can be in the landscape and they receive from the landscape. Again, it's this receptivity that we use to open up the potential, this unknown potential that Turner talks of, the liminality of the place, of the space, of the liminality within ourselves and how we express through that.
So for me, being present at the Karun ship site was very much about the physicality uh, and uh, yeah, the physicality and materiality of the actual remains, the stones. So I was a bit concerned about us being too sentimental about uh, or kind of romanticized the site. That was my concern. But on the other hand, we were all free to, to relate to this site as we wished. But this, this ethos actually also was decisive in creating the soundtrack. I didn't want to um, tell the listener or viewer what to feel in an obvious way. So I didn't want that the music should have an insisting emotional quality to it. Instead, I wanted something very archaic or minimalistic, you could say. I choose to do it simple and in an, uh, also uh, in a way that would invite the other partici participants to be co-creators. I choose to work with stones. So Maria brought 16 stones from Ireland and we picked 16 stones at the Cohn site and uh, the crowd basically smacked these stones together and that's the soundtrack that you hear with some small additions of reverb in the film. For the middle section of the film were the ships out at the sea it was important to have uh, this solitary feeling. So therefore I choose to work with a solo silver bass flute and some sparse percussion to get this feeling. The concluding section, when the ships land at the, the coast, needed a sense of relief, arrival and welcome. And then I actually didn't compose music myself. I asked a member of a group whose name is Danny Burke and who is an excellent folk musician to improvise on his wooden flute, which he did in a very beautiful way, I think. So this was the soundtrack, basically a tripod form with different instrumentation and different ways to execute it. Ritualizing the landscape through the process of moving the ship created an extraordinary community. The uniqueness of this practice involving artists, archaeologists and ecologists working together, it equalised us. And this is the exciting thing about ritualising the landscape, its potential to create community. The equalising through listening and through feeling safe and secure and then having the space to express ourselves individually gave us ownership in each of our own ways in through moving the ship. It gave us a, um, an ability to really sense the landscape through our own personal ways and then collectively through the structured part of the choreography and then the wonderful thing that happens when it grows within us because we've had this experience here we are a year on working together on different projects because of this memory that's in the body that and this memory that's actually growing and changing within each of us and this community hopefully will grow continuously. An example of the expansion of community out of making the ship has been a very interesting process working with the local knitters to develop the pattern from the boat and the spiral into this knitted pocket. And Bodil has this fabulous story from a Swedish myth based on a folded chip that fits in the pocket. So somewhere in here, perhaps, is that chip waiting for its next outing.